And now, a review of Dead Man's Cabal. Dead Man's Cabal was designed by Daniel Newman, features art by Henning Ludwigsen, and Dennis Medry. was published by Pandasaurus Games this year, 2019. Uh, this is a two-to-four player action selection game with a ridiculously unique theme and unique scoring system that plays in about an hour to an hour and a half very much dependent on player AP or analysis paralysis. Now, can you beat this theme? All right, you're a necromancer and you're kind of bored. So you want to go to a party, a dance party specifically. The problem is you've got no friends. So you get a hold of you other fellow necromancers, the other players and go, hey, let's get together and have a party. And they agree. But of course they don't have any friends either. And well, what about guests? Well, who needs friends when you can make your own? I gotta say, this is the most intriguing and unique theme in board gaming that I've ever heard. Now, I, we've talked about this game quite a bit since you started getting it to the table, and really, the theme is amazing. We all seem to agree on that, but let's talk about some details. We don't have an unboxing video for this one, no. so how about you tell people what you get in the box? So first off, I don't have an unboxing video because I did get a copy of this from the awesome people at Pendasaurus at Origins 2019, so this is a review copy that I had to beg them for. I went back to the booth multiple times and went up to uh, friend Jonathan Gilmore and said, please give me a copy. And he's like, no, 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 please give me a copy. And eventually he's like, all right, fine. At the end of the con, you can have one of our demo copies. So this is a review copy that was provided by Pandasaurus. No other compensation was provided. Now, in that rule book, I can't tell you if this is how they came out of the box or how many punch boards it works. I didn't see that. Uh, there is an 11 page rule book. Uh, with the, the whole Biggie cover. I don't know if people have noticed it, but the, the cover of this game is a parody of the famous Biggie picture uh, with the skull with the crown on the head. Uh, it has plenty of examples featuring large full color images of the game components. Like the, the example pictures and the component pictures in this rule book are the biggest I've ever seen, and that's really nice. Like they're almost true to size. Like it's really nice that way with the rules kind of flowing around the outside edge. A ton of white space too, which is really neat to see. Like you probably could have condensed this rule book down to four pages, but it just would have been a wall of text. Now I do have to complain one thing though. This is a weird complaint, but the physical size of the rule book, it's a uh, standard ticket to ride size box. And the rule book is the full width and width. It's huge. And it's big. And when you're trying to read it, it's, uh, floppy would be the best word I can think of. And even if you put it on a table, it's probably not even going to fit on a small coffee table because this rule book's huge. So I did have a bit of a problem with that. But other than that. So not a one hander while you're standing up riding the bus to work. <laughs> yeah, exactly not. And I'll admit, I, I people hate me for this. I fold it in half. I don't do that to a lot of my rule books, but this is one where I literally fold it in half when reading it. So I read one page at a time. It's like trying to hold a newspaper. No, it's not quite that big. Uh, under the rule book is a themed box insert. This is a nice, you know, the plastic style. It's a nice touch and serviceable. Uh, what it's kind of interesting about this is some of the stuff has specific spots, like the, the big round center board has a spot and the, the board you put the skulls on has a spot, but the rest are just compartments for the various components. There's room for everything, but there isn't a specific place to put each thing. Right. It's uh, reasonably sturdy. You're not too worried about it. Uh, it it's yeah, it's last. not one of those thin plastic that's going to okay. crack or anything. It's solid. I've never actually taken it out to look underneath it. There could be something under there for all <laughs> I know. Uh, there's plastic cubes in each of the four player colors. Uh, Ryan's not here to tell us for sure, but they appear to be colorblind friendly because they're not your standard colors. There's like a purple, for example. Um, cubes are actually a bit tinier than most wooden resource cubes you get in most games. A little bit smaller. Uh, they're a nice plastic. I don't know how to describe it, but they're, they're nicer than the terraforming Mars plastic. It's a nicer plastic. And the other thing I really like is they have rounded edges, so they're not pointy at all. So that was nice. There's no need to draw blood on your resources, even <laughs> though it would be thematically appropriate. It, it would. Maybe this is the game that should have, Kelly, you know, spike keep. Uh, your guests are represented by a deck of cards featuring black and white artwork. Uh, I got to say, I like the artwork. It's very, uh, very much caricature style. Um, many, if not all the cards are obviously inspired by real people. My guess is that every one of the cards is, though we haven't quite figured out who they all are yet. Card quality is solid. Uh, nothing to complain about. They're decent cards. Now the game boards are noteworthy. Um, there are four action boards, an action selection board and a scoring board. Each of these is separate and can be put on the table any way you want. Fair enough. 
The game also includes a bunch of short and long corridor tiles, squares and rectangles. Now these have absolutely nothing to do with the gameplay, but exist so that you can place them between the main boards and make a dungeon for your necromancer to be playing in. I thought that was a really interesting design choice. Now I've seen this set up both ways. I've seen you kind of cram it onto a table and, and not use them. Uh, but I've seen, also seen you lay it out with the hallways and there's some good pictures on Board Game Geek of it laid out with the hallways. And I have to say, it really does look fantastic yeah. when it is laid out that way. Now, have you noticed, though, that you get into some sort of reach problems if you if you lay it out? So the one thing I have found out having played multiple times is that you don't need the scoring board at all. It's not used until the end of the game. You don't track points while you play. So now I literally remove that. I don't even put it on the map. Or if I'm building the dungeon, it's the one that's far away. No one can reach. Right. Um, and then the... Uh, the draw cards boards use less frequently than the other ones. So you can kind of put that off to an edge. So once you know which boards can be used more often, we can usually set it up so they're easier to reach. Now, it depends on the table I'm playing on. On my table, I have lots of space, so I like to use the corridors and spread it out. When I'm at the game store that only has three by six tables and we're only got three feet across, I like to try to condense it. Right. So I, both work. I, I don't think there's been a problem but it definitely does help to have some of the boards that are used more often, more centrally located than others that aren't used as often. Seems like this is a great game for a four by four. Yeah, you know, no, I agree. Really, four by four really is probably the perfect size for this. If you've got like a table topper or a game tables topper or something like that, it'd probably be great. Yep. All right, next is the plastic bits. There's a few of them. They're plastic skulls in four different colors, black, white, red, and gold. A set of white, femur style bones uh this is the game currency this is your money and a cow skull or a skull with horns on it uh these are top notch uh they really are nice components uh i actually expected them when i saw them online they looked 3d printed which probably for the prototype they were but the actual components aren't they're obviously uh, injected molded and really nice high-end components they're that slightly flexible plastic which you only really need on need notice on the bones which to me is actually a good thing because it means they're not going to break. They're not fragile at all. Yeah. So despite the theme, uh, it's it's very much following in the theme with the graphics on the cards. It's caricature-like. Yeah. Um, the skulls look great. Now, I've seen the skulls with some shading paint on them, and they yeah, look fantastic. So there are, they're solid minis, and if you want to go to that next step, they do take paint, and you can make them look really fantastic that way. Yeah, I could see that. It's, it's not a not something I would bother doing with yeah. my copy of the game, but it, it would be it would be easy enough. You'd be able to do a dip, right? Uh, yeah. Dip some our modern. We used to always joke about the Citadel dip being a thing. It really is now. There are things called dip paints that are specifically made just for yeah. going into the resources. It probably worked really well. Like I bet you could use a wood stain to do it without having to get into miniature painting. Right. Um, other things in the bag is a silk screen bag again with the biggie skull on it uh, that all the skulls go into. Some cardboard punch outs, very little of them runes in white and black and some vortex tokens. Overall component quality is really impressive. Uh, this is the kind of game that has table presence. It catches people's attention just sitting out on the table, especially if you use those dungeon tiles to make it look like a, a dungeon, right? Or sorry, the, the corridor tiles to make it look like a dungeon. It does help that I run at a local game store that tends to have a lot of role players in it and it tends to get their attention. Uh, the boards are bright and colorful and it, it, it just, it looks great. It has a nice table presence, even without people noticing the skulls. Yeah. Now, I don't know if I'd call it colorful necessary. What it looks like is uh, Torchlit Dungeon. Is the, yeah. the the overall color scheme is Torchlit Dungeon. Um, but yeah. it's bright for a game about death. So <laughs> it's enough. definitely got that. Now, now that we know what you get, how do you play? All right. So after building out the dungeon and setting it up, I'm not going to get into how to set up the game. You're each going to get a skull of every color. So four skulls. Again, red, white, black, and gold. And a starting hand of cards. Uh, these are the people you can summon, uh, the, the dead you can raise. And you're going to start your turn by drawing a skull from the silk cream bag. And then you're going to go to the ossuary board, which has a grid of skulls on it. Three by something, depending on the number of players. Three by three or four or five. Uh, what you're going to do is you're going to put a new skull on one of the rows on the left-hand side. Everything's going to slide down and a skull's going to bump out the right-hand side. That one you're going to take into your hand. Then you're going to look at your hand and all the skulls you have, which at the start of the game will be one of every color plus one new one, and you're going to pick one of those skulls to do an action. The color of the skull determines the action you're going to take, and this action you take is called a private action. Only you get to do it. 
you get to pay all the costs, do all the things, get all the benefits by yourself. Everyone else just watches you play. Then you look back at the ossuary and there's one column that's highlighted. I think it's the third one in. You look at that column and figure out which skull color has the majority then, and then everyone does a public action that everyone gets to take, again, starting with the active player. So your placement action not only chooses what skulls you have uh, or, or is added to your, pri to your private action options, but yes. what's available for the next player to get, as well as potentially shifting what the public action is going to be. Yeah. Uh, that's, I mean, that's a lot going on with one move. <laughs> and it's it's a really simple mechanic once you see it in play. Like, it's not at all it's, complicated. Yeah, I know, it's a simple mechanic, but what that enables yeah. is pretty intense. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, to, to be honest, it is honestly the, the highlight of this game. I love that action selection. I'm kind of jumping ahead to my thoughts, but right. I love that action selection. Now, after all players have done the current public action, you pass the bag to the left and play continues. Game ends when one player has run out of cubes, which we'll get into where those go in a minute, or someone has seven, seven guests. At this point, everyone gets one more turn, and then you do final scoring. Now, final scoring includes points on your people you've summoned. That's the basic part, as well as scoring the Oracle, which we're going to talk about a lot in a moment. Now, here are the four actions that can be taken. So again, they're based on the skull. So if you spend a red skull, I'm probably going to pronounce these words wrong. You go to the sepulcher. You go there to get more skulls. Or you go to the scriptorum. You go there to get runes. Or you go to the athenarium. You go there to get more bones, money, or more cards. Or you go to the sanctum, where you're going to play your skulls onto a big summoning circle with like a big pentacle and lots of lines on it. And by putting skulls out the right pattern, you're going to get to play cards from your hands. And then those runes you got from the scriptorum can be played on the undead you've raised to let you place cubes in the oracle. Now, the oracle is a huge part of this game. There are seven scoring spots on the oracle, and you're placing cubes here. Now, the board scores at the end of the game, but only players with the most cubes and second most cubes on each of those seven spots will actually score that spot during end game scoring. Uh, so it's basically an area majority mini game as part of the game. Now, thematically, it's supposed to be that you're going to the Oracle predicting what you're going to do at the end of the game. So you're predicting that you're going to summon lots of people or you're predicting you're going to have skulls for that's the thematic tie in. Um, the different scoring spots are based on, for example, which color of skull you've used the most to summon undead or having skulls left over at the end of the game. For having areas of connected cubes in the scriptorum, which is another place you spend your cubes. And then there's one that's just worth 20 points for the person with the most cubes and 10 for the player with the second most. Now, I think we've mentioned any number of times about the Oracle and the troubles of getting new players to grasp its importance in that end game yeah. scoring. It is huge. The Oracle is huge. And like I'm giving you the brief overview, I could try to explain it in more detail. It's basically a whole mini game within the game of where you're placing your cubes on the Oracle. It's a, it's something almost disconnected from the rest of the gameplay. Now, I got to say, this is a super broad overview. So really understand this. Like I'm saying, white scriptorum, go here to get runes. There's more to it. It's you can take a bone and get one rune, or you can spend a bone and get two runes, and then you can go to the black market. There's more to it. Um, to really understand the interaction of the cards, the runes, the Oracle, you kind of have to see this game. But I think this gives you an idea of how the game is played. Basically, draw a skull, use it to determine your public action, or determine the public action, as well, then spend a skull to do a private action. Then everyone does that public action you selected earlier. Actions are going to let you get more cards, collect skulls, collect runes, and then spend skulls to summon guests and spend runes. When you summon guests, you want to spend runes to get points on the Oracle for endgame scoring. That's kind of the, the really brief overview. Now, I brought Dead Man's Cabal home from Origins, and the first time actually sitting down and playing it, I was extremely impressed. I absolutely love the unique theme. Like, nothing out there compares to Necromancer Dance Party, the board game. Come on. Like, you, you still can't beat that. I don't know if anyone will ever beat Necromancer Dance Party, the board game. I also really dig the metagame that happens in this game. Every time I play Dead Man's Cabal, players spend time trying to guess who each of the cards are. And not only that, most of the players that I play with end up telling a story as they're playing. So it's kind of like the metagame in Gloom, where they're going to pick specific people to advance 
invite to their dance party based on the cards. They're not going to grab this guy because he's worth 12 points. They're going to grab this guy because he's a flapper and he looks like he fits in good with this other person I've grabbed earlier. And don't you think they'd make a huge couple going to the party together? I've always been really amused by that coming out in the game. Yeah, while they don't name the guests on the cards, there are some very definite visual cues as to who it is this card, the cards are referring to when you actually see them. Yeah, I've actually thought about Googling some of the ones I haven't quite figured out or wondering if we're right on, but there's always been that metagame. The other thing I love about this game is I've already mentioned a couple times now is the table presence. Uh, I, I run a lot of games in public. I run public play events at various venues around the city. Any game that catches people's eye, especially non-gamers who walk by and go, ooh, what's that? I said, this one in particular tends to get the role player's attention. So like, ooh, do you have a dungeon set up? I'm like, no, it's a board game. We're playing Necromancer, summoning the dead for a dance party. And, that, and all of a sudden that role player might become a board gamer. Uh, there aren't many gamers out there that aren't are just going to walk by this one, both due to the component quality and the way the board is designed. And I, yeah, like Sean mentioned, the, the build a dungeon thing is a gimmick, but it works. Now I do have to complain about the rune tokens. They are tiny. Like they are the littlest, tiniest shits I think I've ever seen in a board game. They're a little fiddly to deal with. Um, I personally wish the script forum was twice the size and those chits were a little bit bigger, but component quality wise, that's my only complaint. Yeah, no, it's, it's one of those things where I, you know, I found myself getting caught up by this game. I remember the first time, uh, I saw it on the table. It must've been our first extra life. The first time we did the extra life yeah, on board yeah, game day. Preview of it. And it was just one of those things where I was walking around with a camera and went, wow, what the heck is this? Yeah. Uh, be, and it, you know, it's not like I haven't seen most of these games sitting around. But again, it was just really interesting to look at for everyone, gamers or non-gamers alike. All right, as for gameplay, I really like the action selection system in this game. I would like to see that concept be taken and put into another game. I would literally not complain if someone took a whole cloth. They don't have to be skulls, obviously, but if I got to put cubes on a track and it bumped the cube off and I had to look at a row for a public act, I'd love that. And whether it's public, private actions, maybe you can do something a little new for it. I've never seen that particular action selection mechanic before, and I thought it was really neat. I would love to see that, the, the whole sliding thing. I, that was great. Each of the actual actions you do are actually rather interesting, and I've always had fun playing the game. Like, I like taking more skulls and trying to get my combos and making sure I have the right runes ready so that when I go to summon someone, I can always use two runes when I summon them. And I like trying to make sure I collect the right kind of set of colors. And I like having to make sure I have the right skulls to summon the right people so that I can take advantage of the fact that I know Sean's going to summon. So on my turn, I got to make sure I have the bones so I can summon toy. I love that interaction of the players. Then you get the final scoring. Final scoring in Dead Man's Cabal is some of the most opaque and obtuse I've ever seen in a board game. Well, you do get points for the cards you've collected. That's nice and simple. You're going to get point for every card you played in your tableau. That's pretty standard, and lots of board games do that. The majority of your points, like serious majority, like 75% of your points are going to come from the Oracle board. And until you see this scored at least once, there is no way you're going to fully grasp exactly how it's going to play out and how many points can be earned through the Oracle. Every time I teach this game, I try as hard as I can to stress how important it is, and I've yet to have someone come through the end of it and go, oh yeah, that's exactly as I expected it to be. It always surprises people. It confuses people every time. Yep. It's, and I have to say, when it comes to, I'm just sort of flipping through the uh, the forums on BGG, and it's all about scoring. I mean- Yeah, the Oracle it, scoring. Every, well, it's not even just, I mean, everything has to do with scoring and people trying to sort of place their own concept is like oh i think it would work this way and and, and because that's they, they just don't get the way it actually scores <laughs> yeah it's it's like this odd scoring system ends up with end game scores that are almost never close so one of the things i love about terraforming mars is the fact that at the end of the game after playing for three hours i look at the scores and they're always like in the same section of the scoreboard right it's always like oh if i had just done this little thing a little different i might have won this is completely different. Like the average gap between first and last is usually over a hundred points. I've seen games where it's over 200 points difference. I've seen games where the lead player has more than 150 points from the second place player. And then the thing is you don't see this until the end of the game. So it's kind of hard to tell how many one player is doing. So you can't even do with the thing where, wow, Sean's got a huge lead. We need to attack the leader. But you don't necessarily know that. 
Now, looking at the Oracle board, you could be like, well, Sean's got majority on a lot of spots, and you could try to do the math in your head, but they say it's opaque. It's just not obvious. Uh, maybe that's one of the fixes is you track points as you're going. I don't know. But then you'd be constantly adjusting it every time someone plays a new cube on the Oracle board. So I don't know, because the rest of Dead Man's Cabal is amazing. Like, I really love playing the game. I like the mechanics. I like the way things play out. And I got to admit, the first time I played, the scoring system was unique. I'm like, oh, that's different. The second time I played, I actually liked the scoring system because now I got it, right? Now, oh, now I see. I want to try to collect skulls. And if I do this, and and trust me, ignore that 20, 10 point. Like, maybe toss one cube in there. But, like, the 20 points for that one spot is not going to match the 180 points you get for having someone to bunch of people with black skulls. But over time, it just started to grate on me more and more. I, after many plays, I actually stopped having fun. Once we get to end game scoring, I'm like, I had a great time playing. And I almost thought, eh, someone won. I don't care because it's just so weird. Now, I will note this took time. My first experience, I had fun. Like for the, the one and done game, I think it's good. The one and done game, you're probably not going to care about scoring. You're going to get to the end and go, wow, that Oracle score is different than I thought. But you're going to have had a good time. Sure, I didn't get it, but it was fun. Now, the next couple plays, I actually had a good time because I knew what I was doing, and my score skyrocketed, like into the hundreds and 300 and 400 point range. But then more plays and more plays, I just started to feel less and less enamored, but just with that end game. So I got to say, if you're like most gamers and you're only going to get your game to the table like less than a handful of times, one or two times, you'll probably never get to that point where the end game just has died out on you. My first experience was great, and it was only after many plays that while I've had fun for the bulk of the game, I wasn't keen on the end game. And I gotta say, by not being keen on the end game, it kind of sours the entire experience. Yeah. I'm at the point now where if someone says, hey, remember that dungeon game you brought out, the, the Necromancer game, can we play it? I'll bring it out. I have no problem with that. I'll play it. It's not a terrible game anyway, but I can't see me being the initiator anymore. I'm no, I'm no longer hyped about this game. I'm no longer excited to get it out to the table myself. Yeah. Uh, and I'm noticing that they actually had to uh, do an FAQ uh, about the number of skulls because apparently it's a common thing on a four-player game to run low on skulls yep uh, they that. actually they actually had to uh come up with the faq to handle both running low on runes and running low on skulls well runes um, we run out of every game yeah so uh and so you but you can still perform the scriptorium yeah, once yeah. all the rooms are taken that, that was i found clear in the rule book Okay. We all never actually ran out of skulls. We've come like like so ridiculously close multiple times. Right. But yeah, so they actually they came out with an FAQ on BGG specifically because people are saying in four player games we ran out of skulls. Um yeah. it sounds like some people are using hoarding uh strategies that aren't necessarily good strategies, but exist. Well, um, one of the Oracle spots is the number of skulls you have left at the end of the game. So the game does encourage at least two players to hoard. Right. right. Makes sense. All right, well, for a more in-depth review at Dead Man's Cabal, head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Reviews. Yeah, I go into a lot more detail about each of the individual actions there.